Hey y'all, it is time for week two of Detours by Tony Evans. We are on the proof of Detours page. We're going to start on page 40 with the video answers. Um, I hope you guys have had a blessed week. I thank you for those who have been reaching out to me and commenting or messaging me or whatever. I thank you. Um, I am just so super blessed to hear from you all. Um, I just want to kind of give you a heads up here. Uh, I'm in my bedroom because it's hot and I shut down my extra bedroom. So there's absolutely no air conditioning in there. So I moved in here. So you might hear talking in the background. You might hear my youngest daughter making noises. You might even hear Veggie Tales or whatever movie she's on. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> I did lock up the dogs though. So we won't be hearing any yelling from them or any yelling at them. <laughs> All right, so let's pray and let's get started. Precious Daddy, oh, you are so good to us, Lord. And see, you're probably going to hear beeping, too, from her G-Tube pump. <laughs> um, we just thank you, Lord, for, for all the noises that are around us, Lord, because it just shows us that life is going on, Father. But we most importantly thank you for your still small voice, and we need to get into a quiet place to hear you, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, for what you are about to do today through this Bible study, Father. I thank you, Lord, for what you have been doing, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes to and helping us to dig deeper and to pay attention to, to see what you're doing in our lives, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we are surrendering, Father, and trusting you and and paying attention to the detours that you have for us, Father, so that we can learn and grow and walk in faith and deep walk in our obedience and deepen our faith and trust in you, Father, and that we will learn and, and be able to move forward to um, the final purpose of our destiny, Father. And I just thank you, Lord, for what you are about to do. Bless all these precious women and maybe men um, that are listening to this, Father. And I just pray, Lord, that you will have your will and your way in our lives. We love you, Daddy, and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's see here. We are on page 40, and we'll do the fill-ins for the videos. Um, it says, you know you are on a detour when, number one, God allows the same thing to happen to you twice. Twice. God confirms the truth and application of his word through repetition Repetition of the same scenario. Scenario. Number two, you're suffering for being righteous. Didn't Jesus promise us that? We are suffering for being righteous. Number three, God gives you glimpses of his presence even while your situation has not changed. So presence and situation. Number four, God gives you people to serve who are in the same situation you are. Serve and situation. Ministry during times of misery Misery is critical. Number five, God postpones, postpones your deliverance when you think you had one. Postpones, plural, and deliverance. Number six, sometimes you have to take by faith what you do not feel. Faith and feel. And number seven, God delays until your development and your destiny connect. Development and destiny. All right. <clears throat> so moving on to page 42. Under construction, 
Um, I feel, so this guy was talking to Pastor Evans, um, and I liked what he said. I feel as if my detour has met another detour, and they got married <laughs> and had a baby detour. In other words, he felt as he were running into detour after detour after detour, and that the detours merely kept replicating and multiplying rather than taking him anywhere meaningful. It's easy to feel that way when God is taking you to your destiny. This is because before you can ever get to where God wants you to be, he has to do some twists and turns. In life, at his as it is often on the road, detours exist because construction is taking place. God will take us on a detour because he is constructing something in our lives as well. God is more interested in your development than your arrival. He cares more for your character than your comfort, more for your purity than for your productivity. In this week's lesson, I want us to look at ways to help us determine and confirm that we truly are on a detour rather than simply experiencing a bad circumstance. How can we know that this is a God-ordained detour rather than things just aren't working out right now? How can you discern that you are not under the circumstances of normal life and consequences but rather in a situation that God himself has guided you into. So day one. Oh, sorry, I hurt my back yesterday and it really hurts. Um, day one, suffering for doing right. So after Joseph had worked in his master Potiphar's home for some time, he had earned Potiphar's trust. Joseph was over pretty much everything in Potiphar's home. Potiphar's wife had noticed that Joseph was attractive, so she made advances at him day after day. And let's see here. 30, 39, 6 through 10, Genesis says, So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. That's massive trust right there. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. And he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. So she's bugging the heck out of him, making advances, probably being all sexy and for lack of a better word slutty and just doing whatever it took to get him and he was so strong because that's not easy for a man and he was so strong he did not want to sin against God and I'm sure it was very difficult for him I'm sure that that he really struggled in that and that's one thing that we women need to not do we need to not flirt we need to not dress provocatively because men struggle with that. And, you know, even even men need to be careful what they do. Because we women struggle with that too. And so, you know, I can't even imagine what he was going through day after day after day. You know, was he dreading going to work at this point, you know? I just, I don't know. But I can't, you know, I can't. I am so blessed to see that he put God above his fleshly needs. Um, so let's see. However, Joseph was wise enough not or wise enough to pass on the passes. He was wise enough from God's perspective. That is from man's perspective, the, that decision to refuse the request of his master's wife landed him on the hot seat and ultimately in another pit as she, in her pain of rejection, accused him of rape. 
So Genesis 39, 19 through 20 says, Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. Well, it's only natural that you would believe your wife, right? I mean, you know, you wouldn't expect your wife to be making advances to your slave and then turning around and lying because he kept rejecting her. And so, of course, he, ex you know, expected his wife to be telling him the truth and believed her, you know. So that's that's not shocking at all. Of course, he put his wife above a slave. Um, so it says, Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in jail. Um, so it says, does this verse tell us if Joseph had the opportunity to tell his side of the story? And my answer obviously was no. Um, what happened to Joseph as a result of this accusation? He was put in jail specifically where the king's prisoners were kept. So he was in the area where the king sent, where, where the, when the king told someone that they had to go to jail, this is where they went. So this was probably, I'm assuming, a separate area than where everybody else would go that, that they were just arrested haphazardly or, you know, from other people. These were the king's specific prisoners. How do you think Joseph felt knowing he had made a moral decision but seemingly wound up worse off because of it? Now, I kind of put myself in his position, you know, trying to figure out how I would feel, um, cause it doesn't really say how he felt. So I put that he was angry, probably frustrated, definitely confused, maybe feeling defeated and probably definitely wondering why, you know, it's like, I, I you know, even in our lives, when some, when we do something good and we make the right choices and there's consequences for it. We're just sitting there going, hello, I did the right thing. Why am I being, why is all this persecution coming at me when I did the right thing? Well, Jesus said that we were going to be persecuted for being righteous. And so, you know, that just, that's, that's par for the course. But that doesn't mean that in our human minds, we don't go, what in the world is going on here? Um... A paper back here. All right. Next page. When you find yourself, like Joseph, struggling or suffering, suffering as the result of a decision you made in obedience to God, your struggle is right where God wants you to be. This is actually one proof that you are on a detour. So I really like that because when you do the right thing and you're suffering for it, not only... Do you know that the suffering is because you're doing the right thing and, and the demons and Satan hate it. And so they're going to persecute you um, and the worldly people hate it. Um, but you know that you've brought glory to God. And so when persecution comes, you know you're on the right path. Um, so if and when, and, and like I've always said, if you're not suffering, you're not walking with God like you should be. Because we have to be suffering if, if we're walking with God. So if and when you are suffering for doing good rather than doing bad, we also call that being persecuted for righteousness. You can know you are in a God-planned detour. Joseph refused her out of obedience to the Lord. He said, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. No one is greater there is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? So Joseph recognized the blessings in his life and felt gratitude for how far God had taken him from a pit left to die to a position of great authority and responsibility in a foreign land. Knowing his source was God himself, Joseph made his decision on God alone. Um, 
So it says reflect on a time or situation when you were tempted to sin, but instead chose not to out of your love and gratitude toward God. So <coughs> mine was um, my kids' dad just came out for the first time in nine years uh, a few months ago, and it was not a great time. Um, the kids had a little bit of a good time, um, but... You know, he does a lot of things behind my back. He's trying to manipulate the kids to pull them away from me. And so he said a bunch of stuff to my son. Um, and, and I had a choice to make. Um, and thankfully this was after my deliverance. <laughs> um, but I had a choice to make. You know, am I going to confront him and go off on him? Or am I just going to let it go? And I chose to let it go. Now, it still continues through texting, and the next time he does it, I'm going to block him because it's not like he calls and asks me how the girls are doing or anything, so I'm not worried about that. But uh, out of love for God, knowing that I'm not fighting flesh and blood, and my gratitude toward God for delivering me from the demon of rage, um, I chose not to say a word. Um... And so it says, how did God respond to you at that time or even later in life as a result of your decision to resist temptation? I said um, that I had complete peace um, and I it gave me a deeper desire to pray for him um, and more and deeper realization that I'm not fighting flesh and blood, but I'm fighting demons. Um, so it says, read 2 Timothy 3.12. Um, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not a might be, that's a will be. There's no doubt about it. We are going to be persecuted, you know, and, and the world these days, I had a comment the other day on one of the videos, um, you know, it's it's a struggle these days in this world because it just our, our country itself, the world itself is just getting worse and worse and worse. And the persecution and the division and the anger and the hatred and the violence and just everything is getting so horribly bad. But you got to look at it this way. It's got to get bad because God is setting the stage. He's setting the stage. It's got to be really bad because when we get raptured, if it's not bad and we're not divided and we're not fighting and all this violence isn't happening, then we would already have peace. But if all this stuff is happening, people are going to be desiring peace and just... Of be able to take a breath. And so God is setting the stage for the rapture so the Antichrist can come in and proclaim his false peace. And so God is setting the stage. And it's it's frustrating to be living in this right now because we know as followers of Christ that this is all completely wrong. But when you look at it, from a spiritual standpoint, going, wow, God is just putting everybody and everything and every feeling in place because we're already sick of this and, and we haven't been dealing with it very long. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse are all these food plants and all these, all these um, factories and all these chicken farms and all this. Everything is being destroyed for a purpose population control you know all this gun violence is for a purpose so they can make the gun control things everything's for a purpose but it's creating more and more and more and more division and hatred and everybody including christians are fighting each other with their own pride with their own um um I can't think of the word I'm trying to use with their own um, thoughts and beliefs. Um, but we need to stop using our opinions against each other. And we need to use the word. The word, our words mean nothing. The word means everything. 
And so we need to stop fighting, especially in the body of Christ. The body of Christ cannot be fighting with each other. We cannot be fighting with each other. Um, and that's exactly what's going on. Um, we need to be united. Um, but the world is just, it's absolutely going crazy. But you need to remember, no matter who's in the White House, no matter who's in war, God promised that all this stuff was going to happen. He warned that it all was going to happen. And we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared and on the lookout because he's coming. He's coming and we need to be ready and we need to be grabbing as many people as we can with us to come into the kingdom of God and snatch them out of Satan's hands. But don't fret over it because God's in control. It may seem like he's hands off, but he is completely hands on. He's playing a chess game and he's getting everybody everything in place and all the emotions are in place for people to be so sick of this that they desire peace and they're going to get a false peace but that man is going to come into power after we're gone i, I believe in a pre-trib um rapture um i could be wrong i don't know um but uh you know all this is all this is happening for a purpose and so keep that in mind so you don't get defeated or disheartened. Um, so let's see. So again, I'm going to read Second Timothy because I kind of went off on that. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And it said, summarize it in your own words. And I said, when we live for Christ and follow him, do his will and speak boldly, we will be persecuted in many ways. Um... So we are never told this exactly, but it could be that Potiphar's wife was an actual temptation to Joseph. It could be that she was attractive, the servants were away, Potiphar also was gone, and Joseph may have felt something for her. We don't know. What I do know is that a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice unless it costs you something. So 1 Chronicles twenty one twenty four says, But King David said to Ornan, no, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord or offer a burnt offering, which costs me nothing. And Second Samuel twenty four twenty four says, however, the king said to, I have no idea how to pronounce that name, Arana, um, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. A temptation isn't a temptation unless it's tempting. Knowing this, it underscores the reality that Joseph turned her offer down out of his conviction before God, not necessarily out of a lack of interest. That's important to keep in mind as you go through life and make decisions. God will often ask us to sacrifice or overcome a temptation out of our love and obedience for him, something that costs us something as well. This decision cost Joseph the loss of potential pleasure, his job, and ultimately his freedom. List three examples of temptation for you. You can keep them vague. Um, I put junk food and overeating. It's horrible. Um, negative thinking, that's getting better, um, and being selfish, that's getting better too. <laughs> um, so list three approaches you can take to overcome these temptations out of your love for and commitment to God. Um, so I put, remember, my body is his temple. Um, number two, I put state scripture and take thoughts captive. And number three, I put serve and put others first. So if you are a serious believer and you are making decisions based on what God wants over what you or even your friends or society in general want, the Bible says you can be sure that there will be persecution. There will be suffering. There will be sacrifice. It may come in different shapes, sizes, and forms, but it will come. Negative repercussions Follow those who live by faith. That's something to put everywhere in your house. So 
when negative things happen, you can look at that and go, mm, you know, is this from God? And is this because I'm walking in faith? Or is this just because people are people? Um, you know, and you want your answer to always be because I'm living by faith. In fact, if you never get negative repercussions in your life for godly decisions you make, then that is a good sign you are not living solidly as a Christian. The Bible says clearly that those who make their choices based on their faith, who desire to live godly, will be persecuted. Everyone is not going to be your friend if you are serious about Jesus. This is because you will have to make choices that go against the grain. And I listen, obviously, to Pastor Greg Locke um, online, uh, and that's who we do church with online and everything. And he made a comment the other day, a few weeks ago, I guess, and he said, bring your Bible everywhere you go. Tuck it under your arm and we're holding your hand. And bring it everywhere you go. Don't put it in one of the Bible covers or a little purse thingy. Carry your Bible. Put it on your desk at work. And see who stops coming by your desk. Take your Bible with you everywhere you go. See where you'll stop going. Places that you shouldn't be. Take your Bible everywhere. And watch how people react to it. And that is is how we have to go against the grain and how we'll know that everybody is not going to be our friend um, because they're going to see, oh, she's just, she's not just saying words. She's completely serious because there's a Bible on the corner of her desk and it's open and mm, yeah, no, that's not my thing. And so, you know, they'll back up and those, you know, you got to pray for but that was that was huge to me because it's like, oh, yeah, you're going to see a lot. And then when you have your Bible with you, you're not going to walk in places that you shouldn't be walking into. You're not going to say things you shouldn't be saying or do things you shouldn't be doing or react the way you shouldn't be reacting um, and such like that. You know, we need to realize that Jesus is sitting right there next to you. You know, he goes everywhere with you. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need to pay attention to what we're doing and, and, and how we're reacting to stuff and everything. And, and I love the fact, um, I, I, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever watched the movie Faith Like Potatoes, but Angus Buchan, I, I just, I absolutely love that man. And, uh, I follow him and everything. And there was, he'd gone into a house um, there in Africa, I think he was, and he put his Bible on the ground and he was at some man's house and, um, the man told him, he goes, don't do that. That's Jesus. Don't put Jesus on the ground. And man, that was a two by four blow to my head, my heart, my spirit, my everything. I was like, oh my gosh, he is absolutely right. The word is is Jesus. The word is alive. It's Jesus. When you pick up that word, you're holding Jesus. When you hold him, you're holding Jesus. I have a habit of after I'm done praying and, and reading my Bible and stuff, I kiss the Bible because that's Jesus. I hug it because it's Jesus. And so from that day forth, I have never, ever, ever put my Bible on the ground. I don't even put a pen on top of my Bible because that's Jesus. That's Jesus. He's not to be thrown on a coffee table. He's not to be collecting dust. He's not to be piled under your purse or whatever in the car. He is not to be stacked up with a bunch of other books. He is Lord and King, and he deserves to be first on top and nothing covering him, nothing making him dirty, nothing. And so when I'm in the car, I purposely, I either, you know, if, if we're going somewhere and I'm bringing my Bible, which I need to start bringing it everywhere, I'll have my son hold it or I will, you know, I will do something so it's not on the ground. So it's not on the ground. And I never, I don't even put a pen on top of it. If I'm piling stuff in my hand, Bible goes on top. And that's just, that's just what I learned because it's alive. It's Jesus in print. That That's how I look at that. That's Jesus in print. 
And so I treat it respectfully and honorably and lovingly because it's Jesus in print. So, um, scripture gives us the following verses about suffering for God. So Acts 40, 5, 41 says, So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. So it didn't say that they were crying. It didn't say that they were complaining. It didn't say that they were moping and fussing and everything else. It said that they were rejoicing because they were considered worthy. They were walking the walk and talking the talk. And so God considered them worthy. And so they were suffering. And they were rejoicing in that. Acts 9.16 I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. 1 Peter 2.20 For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? Well, if you're sinning and you're treated harshly and you endure it with patience, well, you know, you're supposed to not sin. You know, and so if you're having the consequences of it, well, goody for you that you're doing it patiently. But you still sin. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it you and you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So Romans 8, 17 says, And if children... Heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And Philippians 3.10 says, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship. Fellowship means you're together. You're in it together. You're walking side by side. So the fellowship of his sufferings, which means that he suffered, so we should be suffering, being conformed to his death. So it says, read 2 Timothy 2.12 again and write it in your own words. Indeed, oh, no, 2.12, sorry. Um, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So I put, if I keep going through the persecution, I will reign with him. If I reject him in his will, don't do what I know to do and what he's calling me to do. He will deny me. Um, Hebrews 11.25 says, choosing rather. So this is a choice. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God. You're not the only one. Keep that in mind. You're in good company. It may feel like you're the only one, but you're not the only one. So choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The pleasures of sin are gone in an instant, but you're going to have the regret for eternity if you're not saved and you're choosing the pleasures of sin, you're going to endure for eternity thinking about, oh, that was really stupid that I was enjoying that moment of sin when you're suffering in the lake of fire for eternity. So it says, in, um, write it in, the, in your own words. So I put, I would rather be persecuted and hated alongside the body of Christ than to follow the world and its pleasures that won't last. So this is based on all these Bible verses. What do we learn about the nature, condition, and biblical perspective of suffering for righteousness? So I put, it's always going to happen. I need to count it as joy because pleasing God is more important than pleasing man or myself. God considers it a blessing to be persecuted because I am doing his will and being like Jesus. So Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because he wouldn't compromise on the job. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego got tossed into a fiery furnace for, for refusing to bow to an idol. They suffered the effects of their decision to not compromise their faith. Ooh. It is unfortunate today how few Christians are willing to bear consequences for their commitment. Too many believers today are moving along as cultural Christians or convenient Christians, 
not so many are committed Christians. You know, the worst thing that I can, that I have seen, and, and it's probably not the worst, but one of the top things that I have seen that I find absolutely pathetic is you're not only supposed to walk the walk, but you're supposed to talk the talk. And when you are wearing a mask that says faith over fear, you are being so hypocritical. You're being hypocritical. I'm sorry, I'm going to flat out say that. You're being hypocritical because that is the spirit of fear. And so we need to be willing to bear the consequences for our commitment. Um, the most critical test you will ever face is the test for suffering when you did nothing wrong. When you do exactly what God has told you to do and you have to pay a price tag for it, you are paying a penalty for righteousness sake. You are on an intended detour that will test and strengthen both your character and your resolve if. If you will let it. Because if you choose to fight it again, you're going to be moving backwards instead of forwards. The greater the calling, the deeper the pit. The higher the destiny, the tighter the shackles. The more glorious the future, the more persecuted the present. Learn to view suffering when suffering for good through the lens of the Lord. You can't, you can't view suffering that you've created because you're not walking in Christ through the lens of the Lord because it's just down, outright sin. Um, this is a suffering when you're doing what the Lord is telling you to do and when you're doing good. He has a purpose for the pain if you will discover how to hang in there like Joseph, even when life does not seem fair. And there is nothing in this life right now that is seeming fair. We are, we are under such massive millions of different ways that they are trying to control and and um, uh, decimate the population, um, the food, you know, crisis, and all these things burned down. It's all population control. Abortions, all population control. All these gun things that are happening, I can guarantee you that there's Democrats and people who are paying these people or whatever, or just Satan or whatever, to do these things, to do these acts of violence. This is, this is all planned, people. Don't get lost in what the stupid fake news is telling you. This is all planned out. Everything is planned out. And stop paying attention to the distractions. This stupid Depp and Amber Heard thing was a complete and utter distraction so that no one was paying attention to the signage of the WHO and the WHO now has control of everything and they can shut us down at any time they want over any little thing. And nobody was paying attention because everybody was focused on something stupid about People that we don't need to know about. It was all gossip. We didn't need to know about that, but it was it was a distraction. It was a distraction from the two thousand mules movie. You know, everything's a distraction. This Roe versus Wade. Yeah, if it happens, it's gonna be a good thing. But all the stuff that's happening because of it is a distraction. Everything's a distraction. Stop being distracted and pay attention to what is really going on and for goodness sakes turn off the news and find reputable sources because they're lying to you like there's no tomorrow even fox news get off of fox news they're lying to you just just stop i don't listen to anything that anybody has to say i have found reputable reputable sources um I have found reputable people on Twitter that I trust that I listen to and then I go on and make sure that they are correct. Um, you know, quit quit listening. Quit, get on your watchtower and start paying attention and quit letting other people tell you what's happening and open your eyes and see it for yourself and ask God to give you discernment because everything is not fair right now, but it's 
all being done for the glory of God and it's all being done to usher in the rest of the book of Revelation. We are in the book of Revelation and God's about ready and he's going to start it. I mean, there are things already happening, but the main part is going to start soon and he's just getting everything ready. So keep your eyes focused. Get up on your watchtower so you can see the whole thing and pay attention and be still and listen and learn. So let's pray. <coughs> Lord, Heavenly Father, give me the heart, patience, and perspective to view my suffering for righteousness' sake as a blessing rather than a curse. I want my detour to accomplish its intended, intended aim, God. So help me to get in alignment under you with my thoughts, heart, and actions in order to honor you in the face of unjust or undeserved suffering. God, we give you all the glory, Lord, and we trust you, Jesus. Help us to be following you. Help us to be surrendering to you. Help us to be putting on our armor daily, Lord, because we need it, Father. And we just thank you for all that you are doing, Lord. Open our eyes and our hearts and our minds. Help us to stand on the watchtower, Lord. Help us to be still and hear your still small voice. Give us a deep hunger for the meat of the word, Lord. And may your will be done. And may we bring you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Have a blessed one.